The Magic Show is brought to you by StarCityGames.com, and check this out. M11 is here, and we've got it all. Boxes, cases, fat packs, intro decks, singles, and foils, all available for order and ready to ship today. Looking for Primeval Titans, Fauna Shaman, and Foil Mana Leaks? You know where to find all of that and more? StarCityGames.com. Hi, this is a very sick Matt Swirling. Welcome to The Magic Show. Back. I feel like they did so much right with the set. If it weren't for Dual Lands, it would be the best set since Unlimited, you know? I like it better than Unlimited. Because, I mean, I don't think Dual Lands are actually very good for the game. Like, it was only good at the time because people were innocent and didn't know better. I think M11 is the best core set ever. It's, uh, the card quality is super high, but it's like, it's not all in one deck, you know? It's not all in one direction or one strategy, and it doesn't, it doesn't lend itself to we're just gonna play all the mythics and make a deck out of it. It did a good job of not just being M10 part two, which I think was the big subtle challenge that I think a lot of people overlook is that if you just did it the same as M10, it would actually feel very boring. So it was a challenge for them to try to come up with something that has the flavor, but doesn't just feel like more M10. I love the, uh, I love the feel of a lot of the cards. Like for instance, the Conundrum Sphinx. It's kind of cool that you and the other person are both, you know, you guys are both supposed to answer a riddle about the future, you know? And uh, whoever's right gets a reward. I think there's what, the, what, what is there, like 243 cards besides Mana Leak? Right? <laughs> so I'm gonna start with the, uh, with Mana Leak. <laughs> the, uh, I think Mana Leak is at least as big a game changer as Lightning Bolt was. Like I think that Mana Leak is not just super good, but it's, gonna be better than it was in before in some context because there's so many good expensive cards now. When you have a counterspell that you can use to mana leak their Oracle Mdaya or their Jace, so you don't have to guess with Essence Scatter and Negate type stuff, you know? Or, you know, you want to mana leak their Thrynix or their Blightning, but you don't want to use a Flash Freeze because you're concerned, because some people play Vampires or, 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 or White Weenie or something, you know? And mana leak just all that. Plus, it's not gonna be late, it's not gonna be dead because later in the game, even if you don't have a card like Jace the Mind Sculptor or something to turn it into a card, I mean, when do people stop tapping out? I mean, are they not going to cast Mindspring eventually or kick their Burst Lightning or cast a Grave Titan or something? I don't know. Mana Leak's unbelievable. I think that the black and the green Titan are as good as they say. I mean, both the green and the black ones seem unbelievable. Ten power over three bodies. And if you attack, it's like you draw two cards onto the battlefield. I mean, and that's not even counting if you do other tricks. Plus, he's a black creature. How do you kill a 6-6 black creature without, like, a plow? And even if you plow it, like, it, somebody told me earlier that they would just condemn it. Great. I'll just hang out with these four zombies that I have. Grave Titan's <laughs> unbelievable. Grave Titan's going to change so much. Primeval Titan, I don't think it'll change as much, but I think it'll go in more decks. I wouldn't write it off because I don't think it's as bad as it looks. I don't think it even looks bad. I think it just suffers from somebody needs to have a scapegoat. Somebody, you know, somebody, you got to have one to rag on because you... You want the black and the green ones to seem so much better. So in order to make them sound better when you're describing them, you need to have one to say that's bad. Are you going to say the red or the white ones are bad? Maybe. I don't know. They're all good. I mean, they're six sixes with three abilities. I mean, like, no drawback. Just three good abilities. If he was an only child, he would have been very well loved, you know? <laughs> As it is, you know, he's probably going to be picked on by his brothers quite a bit. But he's fine. He's got a lot of applications. I think he'll see play in a number of different places. Like, he's a sweet one to Fauna Shaman, right? Like, if you're playing a Fauna Shaman deck, ideally your toolbox has got one of those guys in it. Fauna Shaman is unbelievable. The Fauna Shaman, I think, is better than they say. It's like a Knight of the Reliquary. It's probably going to be the best two drop in the format. Fauna Shaman is like a creature that taps for two to draw two cards. It's like Hermit Druid. I think people would actually respect it more if it was only a 1-1 because then they would realize that it's a freaking Hermit Druid. You can't win. It's a two-mana creature that is tap and pay a green to win the game. The card is unbelievable. We were testing some extended the other day. We were playing, you know, turn one Ancestral Revisions, turn two Bitter Blossom. And the guy plays turn two Fauna Shaman and the fairy deck doesn't have an answer. 
the Fauna Shaman deck outraced it. I actually like Jace's ingenuity. A lot of people are ragging on that one, saying, oh, why didn't you come another time? You know, and I don't blame them, because right now there's this surplus of Mind Springs, and in the world of Mana Leak, I think that uh, Jace's ingenuity is a clever way to, uh, to gain an advantage. An ingenious way, one might say. I like the sword, the Sword of Vengeance. Being able to threaten to put a sword on a creature every turn is super powerful. Like, you just play your Nantuku Shade, sword it up, bash. It's okay. I think it's good. It's a lot more of a Frexian Arena than a Dark Confidant, you know? And it's a bad Frexian Arena, in general. It doesn't blow me away, though. It's just... The format is so aggressive that it's really hard to trade lots and lots of life. Crystal Ball makes it a lot better, though. Which one do you want to start with? The best, the second best, or the other three? Let's start with the other three, and then we'll build up to the good. Alright, so the other three, the, the red ley line, the blue ley line, and the green ley line. The red ley line is a niche cyborg card, and it's good that it exists, you know? It's actually got a use. Blue ley line. I think we're gonna have to get Alan Comer on the phone to figure out what to do with that one. I mean, it seems like it could be cool. I don't know. But it seems like it's probably not gonna define standard. Like, I think the green one is gonna be good for for non-tournament type things. Like, it feels good. The green one feels really good. I don't know when you'd really play the green one in a tournament deck. Maybe. I mean, maybe if you just... yet another way to just bone red, right? <laughs> Can you say that on the show? Yes. All right, and I'm gonna take a stab at the last two. Okay, which one's the second best and which one's the best? I forget. Second best is white, and then the best one is the Lindley Line of the Void. I disagree with your order. Really? Yeah, I think that maybe. I'm not sure yet, but I think that the white ley line might actually be better than the black ley line, like in Magic. Like the white ley line is unbelievable. The black ley line is just so good at what it does right. that it may be remembered as being the best ever at what it does. This card is better than Ivory Mask, and it costs zero. I don't know, isn't that card good? I'm not saying it's bad. And you, it doesn't even give you Shroud, it's only Shroud from your opponent, so you can still Ancestral yourself. It's Troll Shroud. The card seems unbelievable. It seems know. great, uh, but for what it's worth, I feel like Leyline of the Void is better because now we live in a Vengevine world, Vengevine and Bloodgast, and the things that you can do with those cards. Uh, and I'm not, I'm Shaman. not Leyline of the Voiding people's Vengevines anymore. Brian David Marshall changed my life. Really? I'm haunting echoesing everyone from here on out. <laughs> vengevine me. I wish you would vengevine me. Vengevine me. Do it. Do it. Please. <laughs> haunting echoes has been legal this entire time. I know. Why didn't anybody invent that? Nobody. All right. Well, you're not going to tell anybody, right? No. We gotta, okay. Keep it up. <laughs> it's just between us. The card's good. It's worth trying. But I don't know if it's going to be good enough because... It might be power in a direction that isn't relevant enough, but it might be totally awesome. Mm -hmm. Cards, that card is a card that if I got a, if I get to reserve judgment on five cards, that's one I'm going to reserve judgment on. My Totic Slime is fun. I think about my Totic Slime sometimes. I'm on the subway, going to my destination, and I'm just imagining combat scenarios involving my, you know, the slime. <laughs> Talk about being able to wrap your mind around the flavor of a card, you know? People keep thinking, oh. This is just the best of type two. It's a fine starting point. But I mean like, the five best decks that I know of right now, Fairies is the only one that was an existing archetype before. Because I think that the card pool isn't just twice as big, it's like there's four times as many interactions. And uh, and even the Fairy deck, the reason the Fairy deck is so good is that it's not just, it, it's better than it ever was in type two because you have all of the good cards. You have Ancestral Visions, Bitter Blossom, all the Fairies, you have access to Damnation, you have Teachings, Jace the Mind Sculptor, you have, per your mana is even better, you've got better removal, you've got Creeping Tar Pit, which is totally amazing, you've got cheap counter magic, I mean, Fairies is so good because it really does have great cards in all the blocks that are coming together to just, I don't think that just porting the old Type 2 decks in and adding Tarmogoyfs is really the way to do it. I mean, Moto already corrupts almost every format simply because the hive mind can immediately get up to speed so fast that uh, no, like most people, don't, like almost everybody in the tournament's got a good deck because they just, you know, we're at what would you say over ninety percent of every tournament now is just net decked. And the the weird thing though, there's a hidden price. It's destroying the ability of most people to build good decks. It's a vicious cycle because the more that people become addicted to net decking and addicted to motor results for doing the playtesting for them, 
the worse that everybody's going to be at building decks and the more reliant in the future they're going to be. Like we've already reached a point where, I mean, how many decks out there right now are being like the same 10 guys behind and it's not like there aren't other good deck builders out there, it's just that everybody's copying those same few people over and over again, and it becomes so easy to let Conley Woods do your playtesting for you. Why do you think all the big breaks appear in real life? You can save that stuff for the real world. You don't have to show everything on Moto. Everybody's just copying all the time, and the problem is that when they copy, they win more now, and so they love that feeling and they want to keep doing it, so they just keep copying good decks. Whereas if they would just try making their own, Nine out of 10 decks I make are terrible. And I make a lot of decks. Can you imagine how, like, I mean, people who haven't, don't have as much of experience trying to make decks? It can be very, very, very hard. And a lot of people just can't stand constantly showing up and then just boom. Death by Bloodbraid Elf. Blightning, once again. Oh, oh, you're gonna counter all my spells in the Mind Spring? Uh -huh. Oh, Venge Vines. Oh, that's funny, I can't kill those. And they just get beat by the same cards and then they get frustrated because they keep trying out ideas and they don't know how to move forward enough to, to be able to beat all those different things. It's really kind of weird to think about where deck building is gonna be five years from now. There's so much technology in the decks that people are playing and almost nobody understands the technology of the things they're wielding. It's like, it's like a bunch of people running around with laser guns and rocket packs and all these, all these pieces of technology that they have no idea how they operate. They might as well be magic, you know? They might as well just be magical things. It's a young player trying to make his way in this game would do really well to suck it up and actually try to develop the skills on their own to build and break because there's gonna be a real shortage. I mean, not everybody who's building decks today is going to be building decks uh, five years from now, 10 years from now, and uh, and there's a real opportunity for greatness in people who do what it takes to cultivate those skills, you know? And my question is, does that innovation only come from paper, essentially, because of the hive mind and the way that online can just sort of assimilate and destroy any new ideas? I don't think it only comes from paper. It's just that if you do it online, you are throwing it into the wind. The hive mind is really good at tuning, but the... Uh, the hive mind doesn't really innovate at all. There's a real opportunity for greatness with somebody, uh, for anybody who wants to become good at building decks. You know, there is a real need for deck builders these days. I think that there are some really brilliant people who are designing cards who are thinking long term. They're not just thinking about how to make, you know, how to make cards for this year or next year. They're thinking how to make the game last their entire life. I think that magic will outlive us all. I really do.